say we're going to get started. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I'm Michael Speaks. I'm Dean Thank of the speaker. School of Architecture. I'm very happy to welcome you all here for a continuation of our celebration of Black History Month. Um, we opened uh, on the 2nd of February with a, a Kermit J. Lee um, exhibition uh, cu uh, curated by Nomus uh, down in the Marble Room, which has been renamed the Living Room uh, and in honor of uh, Professor Lee. And tonight we're gonna, we will have uh, two lectures, a small symposium also uh, celebrating um, Professor Kermit Lee. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about the evening events because uh, we're gonna. This is not the only thing we're gonna do. We'll have a uh, two presentations here, um, and then we will go immediately upstairs, just outside the library, to open a show of drawings uh, by Professor Lee called <coughs> Left. Uh, it's called Left because in 1994 Professor Lee had a stroke and he was right-handed. Thereafter, he used his left hand to draw these uh, the drawings and, and made many, many paintings and um, in some ways didn't lose a step. The work is, is as exquisite uh, post-94 as it was before. So we'll open that show and then we will go downstairs and have uh, a panel discussion um, with our speakers and with, uh, with Carolyn George. Um, who is Kermit's daughter. So um, with that, I'm going to give it over to DJ Butler, who is the president of NOMAS, the, our local chapter of the National Organization for Minority uh, Architecture Students, uh, who this year were the winners of the National Design Company. <laughs> When DJ, when DJ arrived, he came to me and he said, uh, I want to restart the Nomis chapter here. Uh, I want to do the competition and I want to win it. <laughs> and I said, that's all great, DJ. I'll help you. We'll support you. But you gotta, you've got to win it. And they did. So <laughs> fantastic. So uh, DJ's going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the other events that we've done that we may be doing. Um, and talk a little bit about, I think, uh, our students' uh, work uh, on some issues around Black History Month. And with that, I'll give it to DJ Butler. Um, thank you, uh, Dean Speaks, um, and the School of Architecture uh, for coming out and supporting uh, the National Organization Minority Architects Student Chapter here at Syracuse. Um, Man, this, is, this has been a lot to us. A lot of work has been put into uh, all of the efforts that everyone has seen going forth uh, this month. Um, I also want to thank Dean Speaks' staff um, who has worked with our e-board as well. Um, and in that, in that same mind, I want to give a shout out to our e-board who has been tires, tirelessly working together um, to execute everything that you have seen um, this month. Um, it's been a, a diligent effort. Um, it's been a, a heartfelt effort to um, understand that our inspirations have come from those who came before us, uh, which is why we decided to um, honor and pay tribute um, to Professor Kermit Lee. Um, and having his daughter, Karen George, come even made that moment even more impactful. Um, and to understand what that means to us as individuals of color and to see the support of individuals of color. I just want everyone to know how much this means, um, not only to us, but I can speak personally to myself. Um, and in that, we understand that there are so many things going on uh, within our society um, and within our campus. Uh, we can't turn a blind eye to that. Um, but in doing so, we give honor and pay tribute um, as we talk about the diversity um, and not only within um, the cultural environment, but within our profession of architecture. Um, so with that being said, um, I will pass on the mic to Professor Sekou Cook, who will be our moderator um, for this evening um, and the discussion of the diversification of the scope of architecture. Without further ado. Thanks, DJ. Um, hey, everybody. Hi. How y'all doing? Good. 
Um, so I have been here since 2010, um, which is scary to, to think that um, that's 10 years ago when I first started here. And I've seen many different um, groupings of uh, different versions of the NOMAS group, the minority architecture group here. Um, I've seen it be very active. I've seen it be virtually non-existent. And I have to say that this group of students has really knocked it out of the park this year. Um, th not just winning the competition, but all the organization that they've done over the last year. Um, and I meet with them sporadically here or there. And uh, when they last sat me down and told me all the different events that they have planned and all the different things that they're doing, I was absolutely blown away. And I couldn't believe they could do all that and still be active architecture students. Um, so they deserve a lot of respect for all the things that they've been able to accomplish this month and all the things that they continue to do to keep this this strong. So it's, it's up to us from the administration and faculty side to really support all the work that they do and make sure that they um, continue to have solid numbers so that they can um, create longevity and continuity within the structure of their organization. Um, I have the pleasure of inviting or introducing um, our two speakers tonight. Uh, we're very lucky to have both uh, uh, two really amazing uh, female architects um, with us that have come back to the school. Um, uh, the first is uh, Renee Camp-Rotin, and she happens to be the first African-American female graduate of Syracuse Architecture. Um, she did that in uh, cum laude in 1975, and uh, which is really appropriate given that this symposium is in honor of Kermit Lee, who was the first African-American male, African-American period, to, to graduate from the School of Architecture. And to think that the School of Architecture is over 100 years old, um, and the that first African-American male graduated in 1957, and the first African-American female didn't graduate till 16 years after that, or 18 years after that. Um, so Renee is also, also continuing her education at the AA in London. She got the diploma, um, a diploma uh, and received the RIBA, the Royal Institute of British Architects Level Two Distinction. Um, she continued on with her education, had a master's degree uh, in planning at Columbia University and um, has worked in New York City with the Urban Design Group, has uh, taught at Howard University um, in urban design, history of, history of architecture, and something called tropical architecture, which I'm very interested to know more about. Um, she has done many other, uh, played many other roles um, in Maryland with the National Capital Park Planning Commission. Um, with Atlanta, part of the 1996 Olympic development team there, um, and uh, running the, the um, helping to run the Civil Rights Street Museum project. Uh, she is um, currently the CEO of Studio Rotan, and she has also been working on a really amazing project for Africa Town that she's going to tell us more about later. Um, and I first met Renee um, several years ago at NOMA conferences. Um, she came back to Syracuse a couple years ago to do the coming back together that they do here every three years. I met her there and most recently at the Brooklyn um, NOMA, NOMA event where the Syracuse students won the competition. Um, our, after that, we'll have another short presentation from Taya Wynn who, um, what, you know, when I've looked, uh, going over her CV with her, I was asking which one of these things is, is current. She's like, they're all current. Wow, <laughs> you're doing all these, all these things, that's amazing. Um, she's the director of project planning at Habitat for Humanity in Philadelphia. Um, she's an adjunct professor at, at Thomas Jefferson University and Temple University. Uh, she works, she's founder of Jumpstart West Philly um, she's the chair of housing subcommittee and on the executive committee at West Philadelphia Promise Zone. She is uh, the board of directors of AIA Philadelphia. She's a past president of, of 
of Philonoma, um, and she's also a conference advisor for the East Coast Project Pipeline. Um, she's a project advisor, sorry, uh, national Con conference advisor for NOMA and works with the East Coast Project Pipeline. And if you don't know what Project Pipeline is, that's the, the main tool for getting more African-American students into architecture programs across the country. Um, and uh, she is also working with the advisory board for Streetbox Philadelphia and um, with the, something I hesitate to mention, the Hip Hop Architecture Camp. So um, <laughs> without further ado, we'll start with Renee okay. Camp. Thank you. It's quite an honor and pleasure to be here. You have no idea. Uh, thanks for putting me up at the Sheridan, by the way. <laughs> I got up this morning and I called Sekou and I said, well, how do I get to Slocum? He said, well, you should know. You were a student here. I said, that was 50 years ago. <laughs> I was here 50 years ago. I was 17 years old at the time. I was talking to Karen. I said, boy, time really flies when you're having fun, right? <laughs> So thanks for inviting me, uh, especially on this occasion, to celebrate the lifetimes and generosity of Professor Emeritus Kermit Lee. My pleasure, absolutely. I actually took a picture of the staircase I was on when Kermit offered me an opportunity to go to Columbia University. That changed the trajectory of my life. So, the name of my presentation, and I have 99 slides here, so I'll go fairly fast, It's Do Not Be Afraid. What I wanted to do was really share with you the trajectory of my going to institutions of higher learning. We can talk about the institutions of lower learning later. <laughs> but of course, here is Syracuse campus, entered in 1970, an honor to even be here at the time. There were 100 kids in my freshman class, five black kids. And Dick Richards gave the orientation lecture, and he said, I just want you to know that of the 100 students who are here, 20% of you will not graduate. And he was looking at the five of us huddled. And I said, I don't even know these other four people. <laughs> I had nothing to do with them, and actually I did not know them. But he was more than right, because at the end of five years, I was the last one standing. Huh? So statistics. But starting here at Syracuse University, the reason that I had the opportunity was because of a lecture that was given in 1968, I'm going to pass little things around, by Whitney Young to the AIA National Convention in 68. And at that time, Martin Luther King had just been assassinated. Our cities were burning. DC was burning. I'm from DC. Watts was burning. Detroit was burning. AIA invited Whitney Young, National Director of the Urban League, to address the architectural profession. He said a couple of things there. One of the things that he said was, as he looked out into an all-white male audience, do you realize how totally irrelevant you are to the building of inner city communities? And AIA said, ah! And then Whitney Young said, I'm going to make a challenge. It's time for AIA to diversify. You all have got to go across this country and find black students if you can engage in the profession of architecture. So AIA put a commercial on television. And in that commercial, it said, if you're smart and if you're creative, if you're left brain and if you're also right brain, we invite you to apply for a once in a lifetime scholarship to the university of your choice to pursue architecture. Now, I wanted to be a painter. I was salutatorian in my class. And my parents and grandparents said, no way. Here are your choices. Doctor, lawyer, Indian chief. <laughs> no room for starving artists in this family. So that commercial saved my life. Huh? 
It hit all of the buttons, it checked all of the boxes. So I applied, got accepted, chose Syracuse, not because I knew anything about Syracuse, but because I was dating the captain of the football team in high school. <laughs> And he wanted to come to Syracuse because he wanted to be the next Jim Brown. Jim Brown's a graduate of Syracuse, right? So I was following my heart. I got in, he did not, and I said, snow you later, okay? <laughs> so that's how I got into Syracuse's program. I love telling that story because it's so doggone true. But in terms of the money, I got here because the money to attend this august institution was paid for by AIA and the Ford Foundation, hmm? the first minority disadvantaged scholarship program. Thank God that Whitney Young shook them up at that convention. Words are things. Words can make things happen. So did my five-year trek here, parenthetically, because two of those five years I spent at the Architectural Association in London. Changed my life completely, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And then from there, I came back my fifth year. I spent two years in London, came back my fifth year, and accidentally bumped into Karen George's father, Kermit Lee, on the staircase out there, who offered me an application to go to Columbia in planning. And that's where life really took off for me. We'll talk about that for a minute. This last picture is a picture of the Architectural Association. Okay. So kind of fast forward, I land at the Architectural Association and I had the honor of working with Archigram for two years. Now these guys were off of the chain, all right? They were at the top of the fantasy uh, routine. And in fact, I remember one of our first projects was to design housing on the planet Mars. And when they came into studio to announce that as the design problem, they came in dressed in space outfits <laughs> as astronauts. And I said to myself, now these are my kind of people. Right? <laughs> so that was extraordinary. I worked with them for two years. My next big hit, again at the AA, was this guy right here, Paul Oliver. You've got to look him up. I hope you're taking notes because some of these intersections have happened to me you need to know about some of these people who have made a mark and gone on to wherever great people go. But Paul Oliver was the European expert on African architecture. He took me under his wing. I took world architectural history from this great man for two years. Had it not been at the AA, had it not been for Paul Oliver, I would not have sought the AA's third year travel fellowship, which sent me to Africa to do a fellowship on 101 ways to build housing out of mud. I went to villages that were not on the map. I went to cities that no one had heard of, Sekudi Takarati, Kumasi, Tamale, Bogotanga, Navrango, by myself. I would never do it again, I'm not that crazy. <laughs> but I went with a Super 8 camera, and produced a number of photographs of building housing out of mud. At that time, I saw myself being the Condoleezza Rice of the United Nations Housing Development. I wanted to do housing in Africa. That's what I wanted. And so, I came back from Africa. I talked to Paul. He said, do you have any idea what you've done? You have done some anthropological work that no one has ever seen. And years later, I bumped into Paul in Paris. He says, I'm going to offer you a contract with Cambridge University Press because he produced the Atlas of Vernacular Architecture of the World, also the Encyclopedia of World Vernacular Architecture that was published by Cambridge Press with 700 contributing authors. All the architecture in the world that had been produced Architecture without architects. Better than Sir Bannister Fletcher, right? We had the Sir Bannister Fletcher Bible when I was in school. And it did not talk about the architecture 
of non-European cultures. So I had an opportunity to work with Paul, and this book actually ended up getting the Sir Bannister Fletcher uh, Award from the Royal Institute of British Architects. Another very important part of my education has been world travel. I've been to 33 countries and counting. I've ridden on the backs of elephants in Nepal. I've flown over the Arctic to actually see the ice cap melting with my own eyes. I was in Cuba. I've been to Morocco. This is one of my favorite <coughs> pictures here at the top. I spent a day in a yurt, a goat-haired tent in Morocco at the base of the Atlas Mountains. After being driven on all the curvy roads at the base of the mountains as I went from Fez to Marrakesh. And this picture here is one of my personal favorites. I've been on six safaris from East Tanzania to West Tanzania, then chartered a plane to go to Rwanda to spend days with the silverback gorillas in their natural habitat. So do not be afraid. Lots of education. Because of Paul Oliver, I was that student who went to Ghana to see how traditional habitats were put together in mud. And then years later, I go to Serengeti and I get to see the inside of a mud hut that is now one of the most expensive hotels in Tanzania, the Ngoro Goro Lodge, $1,100 a night per person, and it sleeps 10 people bring the entire family. <laughs> so do not be afraid to visit faraway lands and also make some friends along the way. I've worked for 10 mayors as an urban policy advisor. One of them was Mayor Bell in Birmingham. And then I picked up some really cool friends along the way. Not architects. You've got to diversify in terms of the folks that you make professional friendships with. But I became very good friends with Tracy Martin. Her father, world-class photographer, Spider Martin, who took all those famous photographs. Selma, Alabama, the march to Selma and the crossing of the Edmund Pettus Bridge, became great friends. She then introduces me to Ron Froelich, a white South African defected from South Africa during apartheid, but was president of the World Games for 20 years became one of my best friends. We now, of course, in Birmingham are getting ready to have the 21 World Games because of Ron. And these two, with this mayor, gave me a challenge to put together an exhibition that compared living conditions in segregated Alabama with living conditions in segregated South Africa. So for an entire year, I got to work on Images produced by Spider Martin and also with Peter Mugabani, who was the private photographer for Nelson Mandela. Mugabani sent me 200 photographs, he's in his 80s, of all of the photographs he had taken of apartheid in South Africa over the last 60 years. He sent 200 images to me with no text and no descriptions. So it took me a year to research each one of those thumbnails in order to design an exhibition. Aside from working, married two kids, Aaron Ty. Taught at Howard University. Organized the first national conference for black women in architecture. Forget what year, 83. My keynote was Norma Sklarik, first woman to be licensed state of California. <laughs> Had it not been for this conference, many of you would not know her name. I was given a challenge while teaching at Howard by Dean Harry Robinson, who had gone to lunch with someone at AIA and came back, plucked a $1,000 check on my desk and said, do something for black women in architecture. I was like, what can you do with $1,000? You can do a lot with $1,000. What I did with that $1,000 was to call Norma on the phone 
and asked Norma if she'd be kind enough to be the keynote speaker. Once she said yes, I got 22 other women to come and speak for free because they wanted to meet Norma Sklarik, right? So that's what you can do with a penny and a dime. I also started a newspaper at Howard called Stone that I produced on a monthly basis so students would know what was going on in the architectural world outside of that limited space that you call the studio. You become so studio prone, you forget to look and see what's going on in New York, Chicago, Paris, Lusaka, Mombasa. I also had the opportunity to ghostwrite this book, How to Save Your Own Street, which tallied all of the work I had done with the Urban Design Group in New York because I was in New York because of your dad. So I worked with Jacqueline Robertson and Jonathan Barnett, but most specially, I got to work with Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis for an entire summer because she was the editor of this book. And the only reason that I got chosen to participate in that project, the Urban Design Group was an architectural firm that literally was embedded inside of the Planning Commission. 20 people I worked with from all over the world Raquel Ramati was the director, and she says to me, you've got to ghostwrite the book. I said, oh, why me? I'm just a college kid. She said, because out of the 20 people in Urban Design Group, you're the only one who speaks English and writes English as your first language. So that's how I got that opportunity. Moving forward, lived a lot of places in my life and time. One of the places that I moved to was Atlanta. From DC originally, done a whole bunch of stuff, but I got a cold phone call one day from a friend of mine who used to go to Syracuse University, who dated my best friend while here. He now is a chief operating officer for the mayor of Atlanta. He calls me up, he says, I'm gonna ask you one question. Are you interested in working on the Olympics as a master planner because we're looking for one? I says, I don't know. Let me think about it. He says, you have 24 hours. So 24 hours later, I called him and then became a member of the Corporation for Olympic Development in Atlanta. We put together 18 neighborhood plans in anticipation of the circus coming to town. Olympics comes with all of the athletes and all of the coaches. But each city is responsible for master planning so they can accept the construction of new facilities. This was a plan that I worked on that was called the Memorial Drive Master Plan. Olympic Park, I worked on Olympic Park, design and construction of Olympic Park, and then I was given a special project all to myself, which was called Designing Hawk Walk. We were also working on the construction of Phillips Arena at the time, and we had to figure out a very clever way of getting people out of the building, onto parking, and into the subway. So I came up with the Hawk Walk. Then I was made Director of Economic Development for the city of Atlanta, and I had a really big headache of a problem. We had millions of people coming to Atlanta, and of course they were gonna walk up and down Peachtree Street, and then they were gonna to go to the King Center. Well, the only way that you can get from Peachtree Street to the King Center is to walk Auburn Avenue, which was a total blighted nightmare. So I started to think of creative ways. How do you host people, all these visitors, past our blight, to get to this ML King Center? I came up with an idea that what if I turned Auburn Avenue into an outdoor street museum that you could only visit at night I couldn't reconstruct the buildings, but what I could do was project the dreams of what those buildings could look like in the future on buildings at night and turn it into an electric avenue. As part of that project, I also had an opportunity to design the facades of new buildings that were up and down Auburn Avenue. These are some of the problems that I had to confront. Luckily, as Director of Economic Development with an urban design background, 
Anytime a project crossed my desk that had to do with the economics of the city, I started drawing ideas as to how we could improve the situation. So here was the issue. In order to get from Peachtree to the King Center, you had to walk under a dark viaduct in Atlanta, plus a whole bunch of blight. So I held a competition, a film competition, from diversified neighborhoods to send in all the films of their neighborhoods. We got films from Vietnamese, from Indian community, people that we didn't even know existed. And the idea was to turn that darkness into an enlightening situation by showing films underground in the viaduct. Then I did something that all of you always need to do, and that's enter international design competitions. I forget what year, it's probably 20 some years ago now. But I entered the Grand Egyptian Museum competition. And whoever won this competition, in fact, would get the opportunity to actually construct it. There were more than 2,000 architects who participated in this program. The competition ran for about six months, nine months. I found out about the competition six weeks before it was due. Put a team together, Ligoretta, and also Abdul Halim Abdul Halim, who was director of the architecture school at University of Cairo, was one of my partners. Long story, we'd met in Paris, the rest is history. We put this team together and literally came in 21 out of the 2,000 entries. And I'll tell you some of the moves that we made here. First of all, the museum was underground. and was at the base of the pyramids in Giza. So, so as not to distract any architecture from the grandness of the three pyramids, everything was underground and all of the circulation was in alignment with the stars. Then what I did was I took the entire program, which was this thick. This museum was to have contained all of the King Tut collection. I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of objects. And one of the questions in the competition was, how can you ensure that museum visitors will come back time after time for repeat visits? Because that's really how museums make their money. And I came up with two ideas. One idea was, when you come to the lobby of the museum, you pay for your tickets, you get a backpack, then you become an explorer in the museum. But you look at all the artifacts on a menu board, just like when you go to McDonald's, and you have a Palm Pilot in your hand, and you check off all of the objects you want to see while you're in the museum, and then you put the time in, how much time do you want to spend, and the Palm Pilot would basically print out for you a path to navigate through the museum. Other big idea, curatorial wonder, was I created exhibition spaces or boxes that the curator could control. The box has six sides. So in this competition, I designed these curatorial boxes where the curator could decide whether the sides, the top, or the floor were going to be transparent or whether they were going to be opaque. So literally, the space would morph around the objects that were being shown. And then I shuffled it all like a deck of cards. The United Nations decided that the best entries, in fact, would be published. Publications are very, very important. Moving on to Birmingham, Alabama. The only reason I got to Birmingham, Alabama was because after 10 years in Atlanta, I get a phone call from the mayor of Birmingham that says, we will beat your Atlanta salary if you come to Birmingham and run my $200 million capital bond program for me. Well, $200 million was a lot of money for the city of Birmingham. But my God, I had been the city's liaison to the construction of the Phillips Arena. That was a $200 million building. I worked on the design of the Atlanta Aquarium. That was a $200 million building. Atlanta built a new symphony hall. That was a $200 million building. 
So the idea of me going to Birmingham, making more money, working with a $200 million budget for an entire city was quite the payday. So I go to Birmingham and I'm given the title Director of Capital Projects, which meant that I got to advise the mayor on what to do with every single piece of publicly owned property. For an urban designer, that is a wonderful dream. So the mayor asked me one day, I have 20 acres of vacant land in downtown Birmingham. There's some folks that want to turn it into a dog park. I said, wait, well, hold, hold, hold up. The most expensive land in any city is the land right in the middle, right? It can't be a dog park. You have your choices. It's got to be a central park. It's got to be a high park. It's got to be a millennial park. Long story short, I hired Tom Leader to come and work with me to create the railroad park, a $20 million park. The mayor gave me $2.5 million to get started. His political enemy gave me $5 million, only if the mayor would put in another $5 mil. So I had $12 million, $12.5 million, to build a $20 million park, and the private sector put in the rest of the money. And this is the first park that had been built in Birmingham since segregation. At one time in Birmingham, during the time of Bull Connor, he closed down every single public park in Birmingham. There were rules on the books in Birmingham that a white and a black could not go into a public park together. They could not play chess together, checkers together, baseball, and any other sport you can think of. So the building of this park was a big idea. Next, the mayor comes to me and he says, we have 40 acres of vacant land that used to be the Alabama State Fairground. What do you suggest we do with this land? Well, I had just come from Atlanta, so I suggested that we turn that 40 acres into an Olympic village for children. I take the plan to city council. I show them slides of the Olympics, world-class facilities. President of city council bangs the gavel. How much do you think it's going to cost? Well, maybe 50 million for starters. Bangs the gavel, I have 50 million dollars. Just like that. So Crossplex was built because of those ideas. Another mayor comes in in Birmingham and says, we're trying to build the Birmingham Civil Rights Heritage Trail. What do you suggest? The white business community had no interest in a civil rights trail that looked back at Birmingham's history the past 50 years. It was not a pleasant history for everyone. So there are really two Birminghams. There's the white community that doesn't want to talk about it, and then there's the black community, the kids that you see that got hit by the water hoses and the dog bites. They were heroes. They wanted the story to be told. So I was given this project <clears throat> and came up with some really great ideas. We have 200 signs in Birmingham. It's the only city in America where life-size photographs of a protest movement, you might want to take notes on this, are reinserted in the places where those dog attacks, in fact, occurred. So you can actually come to Birmingham and actually see the signs marching down the street with the life-size photos on them. Some interior shots of Crossplex, going to be one of the sites of the World Games, by the way. Some other shots of the Railroad Park. Then I wrote a grant to the National Endowment for the Arts. This top picture is like Bethlehem Steel, but it was Sloss Furnaces. I wrote an out town grant and got $250,000 to attempt to turn this city-owned property into a new arts tech hub for millennials and the underserved and brought in Cirque du Soleil as my partner for circus training. This is more of Sloss. Got to convert a church in Birmingham owned by a white congregation that ran to the suburbs in the 60s and left the church behind to the city. I love city property. And we converted that into the Alabama Gospel Center. And now I want to talk about what I'm doing like right now. Right now, I'm working on the Africatown International Design Idea Competition. Last slave ship, 
was found in Mobile Bay just a year ago. And I was brought into Mobile, Alabama to help the citizens there think of what to do, not just about the boat, but what to do about Africatown itself. For many of you who do not know, in 1860, 110 Africans were brought from Benin on an illegal slave ship and deposited in Mobile for five years, enslaved, picked cotton, built buildings, and five years later, they are emancipated. What do you do with 110 emancipated slaves? They had two choices. Work hard, make pennies, lease a boat to take them back, or they could work hard, collect pennies, buy their own land to make their own town. They chose the latter. This is where these people came from. Whatever your concepts are about Africa, you really need to know that in the empire of Benin, these are the statues that were being built in the 15th century. You also need to know that on that ship of 110, there are still descendants on that last slave ship that are still living in Africatown, Mobile, Alabama, 12 families. My partner and I went through all the planning studies. We invited Bill Bates down, president of AIA. We invited Natalie Robertson down, prolific writer, had done her PhD. And then my ace in the hole was, we brought Michael Blakey down, bioarchaeologist who was responsible for all of the interred bones at the New York uh, burial ground. These are other people that I brought to the fore. Wayne Coleman, head of archives, because a lot of these families still have artifacts that were given to them by their great-great-grands. What do you do with that? Brought in Quasi Daniels, and also brought in Jack Pyburn, leading preservation architect. These are all the groups that we had to meet with in order to basically host the competition. And I want you all to participate because the competition is going to be formally announced Juneteenth, 2020, it will run for a solid year. This is me talking to the elders of Africa Town about hosting the competition. These are all of the other people around the world that are interested in the preservation of traditional environments, including IASTI, which was at Berkeley, International Association for the Preservation of Traditional Environments. And of course, we're working with the people of Benin. We're working with ACSA. They're going to help us launch the competition to 130 schools of architecture. I hope Syracuse wins again. <laughs> and so we were asked in putting the competition together, could we do this? And of course, the answer was yes, we can. Because we know that design, in fact, can have a great social impact. These are all the other things that are going on while we're launching the Africatown competition that you need to know about. The Clotilda Discovery, the Smithsonian has the Slave Wreckage Project. We just finished celebrating the 400 years of American slavery. The book Barracoon was published. How many have heard of Zora Neale Hurston? Oops, keep raising. By the book, Zora Neale Hurston, an African-American anthropologist, actually interviewed Cudjoe Lewis in 1928. He had gotten off of the slave ship in 1860. That book was just published. Ghana has its decade of the African diaspora, the Smithsonian Symposium. I'm passing the book around now. Columbia has a global Africa lab. Harvard has the Just City. Tuskegee is about to offer a joint degree program in architecture and African-American studies. And we also just had the movie Black Panther. So we know that Africatown is going to be a model. We're producing a book, a prototype book. I'll pass this around quickly. We're going to have 16 jurors. Most of them are really heavy hitters that are going to answer these questions. Why now? Why Benin? Why Wakanda? We have Jack Travis. If you don't know who he is, look him up. He's going to be chair of the jury. And these are all of our other jurors. Heavy hitting black folks in architecture internationally. David Hughes, Madili O. I want you to write this down quickly. Go to YouTube and plug in International Atlantic Slave Trade in two minutes. And you'll see all of these dots are slave ships 
and animation over a 400 year period. And when you push the button, it'll tell you how many slaves were on the ship and under whose flag the ship was running. So in order to win the competition, you have to know what were the voices of the slave trade. Well, you had the American slaveholders and the shipbuilders. You had the chiefs in Benin that basically sold the folks into slavery. You had the voices of the Africans in America and their descendants and the plantation owners. And the boat itself has a voice. We had to look at plantation economy in Alabama. These are just some of the pictures of plantations in Alabama that are on the National Trust. It's not all of the plantation houses. So we're talking about a really big economy here when you're talking about slavery in the state of Alabama. Not only that, but the slaves were responsible for building their plantations, and they were also responsible for building their own slave housing. So we're bringing John Michael Blatch to the fore, who wrote back the big house, the architecture of plantation slavery. This is a picture taken in 1928 by Zora Neale Hurston of Cudjoe Lewis's house. Cudjoe Lewis was one of the founders of Africatown, got off the boat in 1860, emancipated in 1865, is in his own home in Mobile, Alabama, Africatown in 1928 that he built himself. Zora Neale Hurston took these photographs. What I like about this picture is boyfriend has wood floors. Huh? That's really part of the irony of emancipation. We just got a grant from the Alabama Historical Commission to literally use all of her photographs to put blueprints together to literally build his house. These are the tribes that captured him. In Wakanda the movie, Black Panther, the women were these imaginary fantasy generals. But in real life, they were the Amazonian warmongers of Benin who were responsible for dragging Kujo and his family down to the coast for sale. So those are real life people. Also, when we talk about Black Panther, the movie, which is fiction, it also makes us think of the Black Panthers who were non-fictional community builders. When we think about the movie, we think of fictional Wakanda without realizing that Africa has at least 15 or 20 great empires other than Egypt. Just things we need to know. How do we see ourselves? This is the Barracoon book. Barracoon basically means barrack or barricade. And this is where the slaves were held as they were brought down the coast. You can't talk about Wakandan utopia unless you talk about Max Bond, one of my teachers from Columbia. He's no longer with us. But when I did that mud hut thing on the fellowship, I accidentally ran into one of Max's buildings in Bogotanga on the transistor radio. It said that it's 120 degrees in the shade. And I remember seeing this little building on the horizon in the middle of the desert. And I went there, and my clothes started blowing. Do you have fans or air conditioning? They said, no. The architect built it to scoop up the winds from the desert. So Max had created this unbelievable vortex. Max built the Civil Rights Institute in Birmingham. He built the Martin Luther King Center in Atlanta. And of course, just before he died, he was one of the leaders for the team for the Black Museum on the Mall. So the architectural competition will require you to know something about Africa before you can rebuild Africatown. And what Jack Travis says, we're looking for African forms for African communities. Make a long story short, the Africatown competition will require you to select one of four sites. Whichever site you select, you'll have to design a series of four buildings so we get an ensemble. So you have an opportunity to put together multidisciplinary teams and multicultural teams for the rebuilding of Africatown. And we, when we connect all of those dots together, you will have accidentally, on purpose, created what we're now calling the Africatown Cultural Mile. We have two basic sites to start a historic Africatown. You'll have to design the Welcome Center at the cemetery, a community, and 30 units of infill housing, as well as a gateway to ancestors. For the second site, which is covered in red, it's in a floodplain. 
The mayor of Mobile said, you can't build there, it's in a floodplain. I said, fine, let's flood the floodplain on purpose and make that the habitat for the rebuilding of the Clotilda slave ship replica. You'll have to build 30 units of infill housing. You'll have to develop a welcome center. This was the first welcome center for Africatown, a double wide trailer. Katrina came and blew it away. No longer exists. So we put the welcome center into the competition, said, you know, we aren't talking about double wides here. You need to look and see what they did at the New York City burial ground with Rodney Leon. For the second site, the Josephine Allen site, this is what we're suggesting could happen with the floodplain. You purposefully flood the floodplain, you put the Clotilde replica in it, you come up with a very intricate way that you can take people underwater to look at the ship in its habitat, and then you might even want to put in some underwater public sculpture. Because of the 24 million slaves that were brought over, 12 million were lost at sea. And then after that happens, we're manipulating zoning in the background. We're asking for maritime residential zoning so that housing can be built for the descendants the same way that you have in Nantucket. And all of the seashore cities, especially on the East Coast, maritime residential housing. For site three, 30 sites along estuaries, 15 sites along estuaries are being planned by the National Park Service as the Africatown Blue Ways Connection. So in the competition, we're going to ask you to design a fleet of water-worthy boats to take tourists around, and to also keep in mind what those boats need to look like at night. These are some of my travel pictures for the designing of the fleet of boats. You can look to Nepal. You can look to the boating industry and fishing industries in uh, uh, Benin. And tongue in cheek, found out that a little boy drowned in Africa town five years ago. He couldn't swim. Most black kids don't swim. Something about blood memory, I suspect. But if you Google, you'll find 70% of black kids don't swim. I heard this story, and I said, well, here we have it. In this competition, you're going to have to design the Africatown Yacht Club, which is quite tongue-in-cheek because Africans weren't delivered here on a yacht, right? But at the Africatown Yacht Club, Inner city kids will learn boat making, they'll learn swimming, and once they pass the swimming test, this guy here, Kamal Siddiqui, president of the Black Scuba Association, will teach inner city kids from Africatown how to scuba, and he will take them underwater to see the vestiges of the ship that their ancestors came over on. Site four, I'm almost finished. Site four. 30 years ago, three black legislators in the state of Alabama got the state to donate 160 acres of land to discuss Africatown in some way as a cultural educational site. In the competition, you will have to design four buildings. One is a luxury spa hotel. The second is a genealogical center, so you can come and basically spit on the cot and find out where you come from. And then a museum that talks about slavery from the African point of view, and then last but not least, gateway of no return. While we're doing this competition here, Country of Benin is also launching a competition to design five museums on slavery that will be situated in each of the five cities that participated in the slave trade. One of them was Wida. So, for this fourth site, we're asking you to design an African museum in this 160-acre park. So we're saying, what if? What if you designed a museum in this Africatown USA park where the exhibition boxes were made out of glass, and they were literally sprinkled throughout the park, but they contained some of the Colossus images of the Benin sculpture. 
you would figure that you were really being introduced to history through the trek and journey of an enchanted forest. And then we also shared some of the museums, of which there are quite a few, dedicated to African slavery throughout the world, many of them done by Phil Freelon here. This one is the last one that they did in Senegal, a colossus, man, woman, child, colossus. The museum is contained on the inside of the statue. Not a big surprise. This is our Statue of Liberty in Africa, right? So I'm asking you when you're going in to uh, do the competition that you're aware of a number of things. We cannot promise that any of these submissions will be constructed hmm? because we don't own the land. But as part of our due diligence of the 16 sites, all of them are publicly owned. Isn't that good to know? There are going to be some officials that have to go through re-election in order to make this Africatown Cultural Mile a reality. So in order to implement, you have to have a great vision. The competition will do that. You have to have site control, political champions, community consensus, which is what we do have, master planners, architects, and also money. We know that competitions can make sure that things get built. This is what they finally built in Egypt as a result of the Grand Egyptian Museum competition. We're talking about African futurism at a mega scale. This was what it looked like Wakanda in the movie. Smaller scale, of course, for, Mo for Mobile. But all competition entries at the end of the day will go into the book. So the book will become a catalog for the community to start making their deals on the 16 sites. Not just a single idea, but multiple. So this competition is our love letter to Africa. We've branded everything for the competition, including our stationery to sponsors, jury kits, press kits, brochures. Another spinoff in working with Craig Wilkins, the, Af the Architectural League of New York is hosting a grant. They're looking for 10 editorial teams across the country that can do a case study on a rural community. I put together a team in six days. We got it in under the wire. We're looking at Africatown. We have to look at health. We've got to look at infrastructure. We've got to look at work and economy. We've got to look at environment. But this competition is only interested in identification of the gaps, those problems and obstacles to not being able to move the town forward. We took it on wholeheartedly, and we have to turn in a 20-page final report. One of the things that we realized in putting all of the components of the final report together as a designer, we said, wow, by the time we finish doing all this research for all these categories, we will have accidentally created a magazine. So now, the final report will be turned into a magazine. That magazine will feature the 12 families of the descendants. Pictures taken by a professional photographer, of course. And then we will turn that magazine into a quarterly. The first one will be our final report. The second could be about descendants. Third, about the cultural mile. The fourth, about the competition. And so throughout this experience, I realize that almost all of my education has really been branded around the topics of architecture and cultural identity. Another spinoff, five more slides and I'm done. One of the spinoffs in working in Africa Town is looking at the relationship between Kudjo Lewis and Zora Neale Hurston, the anthropologist. And someone said, I wonder what that conversation was like. And I started thinking about it. And I said, wow, talk about hip hop architecture. What if we turn this conversation between the two of them into an opera? Hey. So I'm now working with the editor of Barracoon and looking at what would happen if I put Lonnie Holly, look him up, Alabama folk artist, and then I got Brittany Howard, 
lead singer for Alabama Shakes, both Alabamians. What if I put them together to help to create some music about this conversation? And the beauty of all of it is that Lonnie Holly is an Alabama folk artist. These two chairs side by side were in his portfolio from like 1980 something. And he labeled it, him and her hold the root. And I said, this is fantastic. We can use Lonnie's own imagery, his own sculpture, this is Lonnie here, close personal friend, to actually recreate this story in the form of an opera to tell the story. And the backdrop for the telling of the story could come from an entire collection of Alabama folk art, such as Slave Ship, that was done by Thornton Dial. Some of the Dee's Ben quilts done by Alabama weaving women, and then Oak Joe Mentor, folk artist. And last but not least, we could even bring in Radcliffe Bailey to help design the set. Look these people up. I realize that so many African American artists have a great deal in their portfolio about slavery. So make sure that as you diversify your education, you really start making friends with people in other disciplines. Artists aren't a bad place to start. We want you to enter the Africatown competition. And I think that's the end of what I have to say. All right, you guys still awake? <laughs> All right. Um, it's always amazing to share a stage with Renee. The good thing is that she's had a little bit more life than me, so I, could be, I can have a little bit less to, less to talk about. Um, <laughs> one of the interesting things uh, that I always notice whenever I hear Renee speak is like a lot of the synergies in our, in our <laughs> stories. And I sometimes wonder, like, yeah, we're both you know, black women, architecture, started off here in Syracuse. And I see so many commonalities um, throughout our path, which is really interesting. So when I first got asked by DJ and the Nomas team to kind of come and talk about this diversification of the field, I was like, oh, you want me to just come and talk about what I do? It's so much. It's so crazy. And it wasn't all like this like mission that I kind of started off on a path. And I often think of my career as this and or, right? Like and, you could do more, or you pivot in a different direction. Um, and kind of understanding all of the ways that my time here and my interests kind of melded uh, to kind of drive me in a direction. So uh, this is the Syracuse University School of Architecture class of 2009. Uh, we started here in this building. There was 110 of us. Uh, there were three African Americans in my class. At the time, I was the only black female in the entire building, grad school and undergrad. Uh, there's me. <laughs> And uh, to say that that was something that was tough is no small feat. Um, I had never been to a place where I was the only one. Uh, I had grown up in Chicago, pretty diverse high school. I came here and it was absolutely flabbergasting um, how isolating it felt in a room full of people. Um, but when I applied to school, unlike Renee, I did not follow someone here. I knew I wanted to be an architect uh, since I was a child, and uh, Syracuse was ranked number two when I applied to school, so it was like a no-brainer. I was like, oh yeah, I applied early action, I didn't tell my mother, and I got in, and you know, that was that. So, interestingly, when I was here, you know, to be a black female in this program, uh, I'm sure it's no secret, I doubt it's changed much, like there's not a lot of history about African American architects that's taught in architecture school, this was the only project that we covered in a class when I was here uh, that talked about anything that had to do with African Americans. And so for those of you that don't know what this is, this is Adolph Loos' unbuilt house for Josephine Baker. Um, in one of my second year history classes, we were supposed to be excited, right? Loos is one of the founders, I'm sure all of you know, right? We went to Syracuse, we talk about Khan, we talk about Corb, we talk about Loos. Those are like the three godfathers of Syracuse program, and here was this black woman that was being objectified. That was the whole project. Um, and so I often thought like how often that was part of my daily life uh, in the building. Um, 
which you know had pluses and minuses. So you have to find your own heroes. Uh, I worked in the architecture reading room. Barbara Opar is here. She's here. She is a treasure. If you guys don't go to the reading room, go to the reading room. I worked in the reading room. I guess it's not the reading room anymore. It's the King and King Library. <laughs> um, but when it was the architecture reading room, I worked in the reading room from probably day three in this building until the day I left. Um, I even worked sometimes in the summer. And I came across a magazine back when Metropolis was like 24 inches long. It was this big magazine. It would come in. It would always be at the front of the reading room. I was flipping through it. And there was a story um, in March 2006, so I would have been a sophomore, about Phil Freelon. And it was called Beyond Black and White. And the picture, this is not the picture they used. It was a washed out picture of him. It was almost grayscale. You almost couldn't tell he was black. And I was looking at his face and looking at his nose and his lips, and I was like, this man is black. So I went to like Barbara, and I was like, Barbara, do you know this guy? Is this man black? And there was this one book called African American Architects in the Reading Room. I think it's still in the Reading Room. Um, and she goes, oh, I have this book. You have to read this book. And she got me this book. Almost everybody Renee already mentioned is in the book. Um, and so I flipped through the book, and I was like, oh, I learned about Phil Freelon. So ironically, there was a guy on campus at the time named Pierce Freelon that kind of looked, had the same nose as the guy in the book. He was a grad student, he was a new grad student studying African American studies, in case you didn't know it's the building next door. Um, and my friends and I got ourselves invited to a party at his house, uh, one of the few nights that we weren't in the studio, and we ran up and everybody was like, oh you guys, because he was kind of cute. So everybody was like, oh you guys are just trying to talk to the cute guy. And we literally like ransacked and we were like, is your dad Phil Freelon? And he was like, yeah. And we were like, oh my God, oh my God, he's our favorite architect. He called his dad. Every time his dad came to pick him up, he would take us out to dinner on Marshall Street. Wow. So I think to remind everybody, like oh, some of the folks that seem amazing to us, they are amazing people, but they are people. Uh, get in touch with them because they are always happy to reach back in here from you. Um, unfortunately, Phil died last year, mm. which is why I keep him in almost every slideshow that I've done. Um, but he was a great resource. And because of our connection to him, we got him on, uh, he was on, reviews the next year for Super Jury, even though it was in our class. And actually, our Nomash chapter brought him to speak um, when I was abroad. But you know, juxtaposed with these really great moments, there are also some not so great moments. Uh, I put this up here because also while I was here, a person, I'm not going to say who it is, they are not here anymore. There's no one in this room, so don't mm -hmm. worry, drew in trace paper on my desk a picture of a black pawn and cross-hatched it. And it was like, this is you in your career and in this building. This is what you are. Um, and you can't unthink that, you can't unhear it. Um, and it always made me question, am I supposed to be here? Um, looking around, I'm, there's not that many African Americans in the field. There are less than 500 licensed African American females today in the United States. So much so that they're counting um, to try to figure out when we get to 500, they're going to do a book. Uh, we are 2% African Americans total of the architecture profession. That number has never changed. Whitney Young came and did this great speech and the number never changed. And then black women are 0.003%. We are not even a whole percent. So oftentimes, no matter how good I was in studio or how many scholarships I got, how well my review was, I often question, should I still be in this field? But I went to pretty prestigious universities. I got my BR here at Syracuse. I then went on to the University of Pennsylvania and I did a Master's of Architecture and a Certificate in Urban Design. And so kind of that fight made me realize, yes, I can be here, I can be here. Um, but at the same time, it was juxtaposed with this. Uh, when I graduated from grad school, because I went straight through, it was 2010. I don't know if you guys, you guys are kind of young. So like 2010 was like the height of the recession. Uh, and one thing that happens in a recession is People stop building buildings because buildings are really expensive. And so a lot of architects are out of business. A lot of firms don't survive. Many firms did not survive the recession. Um, many people in the room that are older are probably having PTSD right now. Um, but this was Architect Magazine in July 2009. And why is this important, this Have You See Me? This is Tessa. Tessa was in my class. She was in that first picture of 2009. Um, and the article said that 13.9% of new graduates were going to be unemployed, which was a lot. 
Um, and so typically women and minorities were the ones that were gonna have the hardest time trying to find a job, trying to get the pay that they needed. And it was interesting because the article wanted to call us the missing generation. They said you, they were projecting us to be the missing generation. And they got a quote from my classmate, Tessa, who was a friend of mine. And she said that she worked, hoped to work for a product design company, sustainable architecture firm, or community development organization. Uh, this was kind of indicative of my class to this day. About 40% of my class is not working traditionally as architects, um, including myself. And one thing that this kind of always allowed me to look back and think about was what drove me to even apply to architecture school. I grew up in Chicago, and I grew up very upper middle class, but this was my neighborhood, or next to my neighborhood, right? This is the Robert Taylor Homes. It's a housing project in Chicago. They got torn down my second year at Syracuse. They sat vacant until very recently. They just started rebuilding them. And realizing that when I was here in architecture school, my studios, my classes did not talk about the urban conditions that I was used to and the ones that I wanted to change. The whole reason I wanted to be an architect was because I was like, I need to fix this. I need to do things in these communities. And I got to school, and we kind of didn't talk about it at either of my schools. Um, but there are architects that are doing some of this work. This is Amanda Williams. from uh, She went to Cornell, and she is doing work in Chicago in some of these neighborhoods. Uh, this is an example of one of her projects. And so it made me realize to exist in this field, you have to exist at two levels, right? The first one is like you are ever the protester. I, you know, it, you, it's in you. There's a famous quote from James Baldwin that says, to be a Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be in a rage almost all of the time. And it's the quote whenever people ask me, give me a quote about your field, that it comes to mind the most. Because you always look around and you're kind of forced to remember that you're black. You're always going to be black first before you're an architect. Um, and you still have to be this consummate professional that everybody likes that is, you know, putting themselves forward in a certain way. And they're often in a very tight balance. So I knew I wanted to work in community development. It was a recession. I did work as an AmeriCorps, and I got a job at a local community development corporation in Philadelphia, which is what led me to Philadelphia. That's what caused me to move back after grad school. And so one of my first projects was a city grant, and I asked my boss, were they okay with us you know, doing this grant? And they had no clue what I was talking about. I had to do a sketch. It was like an ideas competition, and they were like, do whatever you want. I don't know what you're talking about. And I was like, great. And I won with a sketch. This is not my sketch. This is a sketch that was done later. Um, and we won, and it was like, okay, now you gotta make this project happen. They were like, great. Well, you gotta figure out how to pay for it. So I reached out to some uh, professional networks. I got a team of pro bono architects and designers. I was project managing it, and we were able to create this Logan Parklet. It's about a $14,000 project, um, and it did all sorts of wonderful things. It was written up in the newspaper. And from the design community standpoint, everybody was so impressed that I had found a way to stay connected to the field. But the hardest thing, which no one talked about, right, is what happened next? The thing was built, the organization owned it, I am now in charge of running this parklet that I had built, and who was paying for it, how was it being managed, what was going to happen, who was managing it. This became my job. I was going and meeting with the head of Walmart to try to get Walmart to pay for this thing in perpetuity. I was sitting there trying to figure out in the future, how are they going to know how to put the thing back together? Because I had been working with all these architecture students to like, you know, build this model. And that was the hard work. It was translating architectural concepts and ideas to regular people. And so through that, um, kind of led to another project. I did so well on that. My boss was like, well, you seem to be good at this. I'm going to give you another project. So there was 40 acres of vacant city land in our neighborhood that had been blighted since like two weeks before I was born. So it had been a long time at the time that I worked there. It had been over 25 years. And they were like, okay, well, we want you to do one of those things, because you know, I still use my architectural vocabulary. The thing was a charrette <laughs> with the folks in the neighborhood. We want you to do one of those things you like to do. And I was like, oh, okay, but you know, they cost money. You need design volunteers. They were like, well, call all your friends. Figure out, we'll give you $250 and a Staples gift card. Go to Staples and figure it out. <laughs> and so, you know, we spent weeks and weeks trying to put together a program, put together documentation, put together uh, design books. We got some design students to come in and help and run these community meetings. And for many of the design students, they were coming in and saying, this is the first time I've ever done this. Like, I, I don't get an opportunity to do this at school. 
So moving on to there, I got another job at the Housing Authority, and this was my first site. So when I was at the Housing Authority, you know, they were doing large LIHTC deals. These were like 60 million, $100 million projects. Uh, we had four architects, the head of the Housing Authority at the time, or the head of capital projects was another licensed architect, which is why I went to work there. Um, and so there was a team of architects in the office. I was actually hired as a project manager, but because I was new and had an architecture degree, they said, we're gonna give you all the small projects. Small to them meant anything under $30 million. So my first project was 12 units on this blighted street in Philadelphia. Uh, it was like a $16 million project. I had to do both the project management, had to hire the architect, had to manage the team, had to go out and manage CA and do all of our uh, kind of in the field stuff that related to architecture. And this is where I really learned everything about the field. Um, and I was on the other side, right? I was managing the architects. And, I was, uh, and to me it was fascinating because when people don't know you're an architect and you walk into the meeting as a project manager and you start to speak the language or you're marking up their drawings, it terrifies them, <laughs> which is really funny. Uh, so I got another project. This one was $30 million. It was 33 units, same neighborhood down the street, working with a new architect team. And this kind of led me on this journey to kind of understand and to question public housing. So I don't have a slide on this, but I then uh, got a grant from the AIA to go research public housing abroad. So I spent a year and a half traveling uh, to about nine different countries. So I'm not quite at the 33 that Renee's at. I got 10 to go before I touch her. But I was studying social housing uh, in, in other countries to try to understand why in the United States we don't value design in public housing. Um, and through that, I was able to kind of secure a new job working for Habitat for Humanity Philadelphia. Uh, at the time when I came to Habitat, they had already started construction on this project, but it was their largest project to date. They had phased it. They were only like at the very beginning of phase one. They started hitting all these city hijinks. They had underground storage tank. They didn't know how to navigate. And all of my project experience from my previous project, I was like, oh, these are easy hurdles. Like I've done all of this before. Um, and this project was 21 units uh, near Temple University. Which is interesting because in Philadelphia, there's 106,000 people on the public housing waiting list today, like right now, that have inadequate housing and cannot afford to live in the city. And Philadelphia is known to be one of the most affordable cities on the East Coast. And in Philadelphia, for a household of four, uh, most people are living on less than $27,000 a year which is about half of your tuition for those of you that are young and have not had to make money and understand it is not a lot of money. And so working at Habitat, we sell uh, homes to low-income families. And so the cost of the house, the design of the house, the simplicity of the design are all things that become really, really, really important to Habitat. So they're embarking on their next project, which is in conjunction with the Housing Authority, which is why they hired me. They needed a partner that understood the inner workings of the Housing Authority and their restrictions on grants. And we are currently under construction on this project, but it is their largest project to date. Now, what was a small project for me is the biggest thing this company has ever embarked on. And it's 20 units of affordable housing in a neighborhood that's rapidly gentrifying in Philadelphia. Um, and so we have finished three houses. We sold the third about three weeks ago. Um, and the next three are scheduled to be done next month. Uh, but it is on budget, on track, on time. This project became really important because the organization had never done a total development budget, which you guys don't study that in architecture school, but it becomes really important when you're in the field uh, because that's all the cost that it costs to do the project, including the architect's fees and the hard costs of the project. Habitat had never done it. They were a nonprofit agency that lived off of like benevolent donations. They would start building a house and they would keep raising money and they would kind of raise money as they built the house and the house would get finished and they would sell it, they would get some more money and they would kind of cobble it together just enough to keep it going, doing like you know four to six houses a year. 20 houses, you need construction financing, you need to show proof of funds, this was on city land and they just had never had to do it before. Which means me to like, sometimes the things that are really remarkable in a project are not the sexy images that everybody comes to show you at their lecture, right? This is a red line I did of a water department drawing about how stormwater was gonna get from the street to the inlet and uh, not really interesting. This took six months to get cleared. Um, this is our zoning plan. We were just rezoning it and fighting with the council person. I had to go to council, get a whole law just to change the zoning of the site because we were changing from multifamily to single family so that we could sell single family homes. Uh, this on the bottom was because no one in my office understood how stormwater worked. 
And this was me doing diagrams to try to explain to them the difference between the, two, the three systems that we had. Uh, we ultimately chose green roofs, but they just didn't understand how they worked and what that meant in terms of affordability. Because this system, which was the cheapest, is a shared system, triggers an HOA. And in Pennsylvania, HOAs have very unique powers that allow the HOA to take your house if you are behind on HOA fees. When you're doing affordable housing, you don't want another thing out there that's going to make it harder for a person to stay in their home long term. And so on this project, kind of putting together all the things I had done previously, these are all of the reviews in the city of Philadelphia that you need for building permit approval. This is how many I triggered on this project. And because our organization's trying to keep costs low, I am managing all of this. So like I'm the coordinator, I'm coordinating the architect, I'm running things down and getting permits uh, to try to take as much off of their plate as we can. So this became really important to have a person that kind of understood the process of making a building and how to get it done. And like what that opened up was opportunities for new projects. So this was us working with two other nonprofits uh, in West Philadelphia to kind of propose a 100 unit plan. We're working with a private developer. Uh, we have been working on this project for two years. We're still trying to get financing. Nobody is in a position to hire an architect before the project is ready. So like what happens? Because most projects, which they didn't teach me in architecture school either, like the architect doesn't get to pick the project, right? This like utopia of studio that you guys get, enjoy it while it lasts. Because after this, the client rules everything. They're paying you, they're hiring you, their contract is what you will live and die by. All of the decisions get baked before they even hire you because they're telling you the program that you're bidding on. You're telling them how much it's gonna cost for you to do what they asked you to do. And having architects on that side is really, really, really important because we get to shape the project. And so this is us trying to kind of shape the project in lieu of not wanting to pay architects. It's me and a, and a Rose Fellow that's at one of the uh, other companies working on this, trying to do uh, about 100 units in West Philly. And actually, I did this yesterday. I presented this council person about two hours before my flight to Syracuse. Um, so this was me sitting in Illustrator by myself. Uh, was pro proposing 58 units because I'm trying to make an argument that they need to give us a larger site and more land and everybody can't see what I'm talking about when I'm like, I just need this box in this, this neighborhood here. So that, all that to say is that the skills that you get as an architect are, in, like, they're so, so, so useful about all aspects of your life. Even when, you know, your family asks you to do a baby shower invite <laughs> that they're trying to send out as an evite. And so <laughs> one of the most important things that I've done, and sorry this picture is really, really blurry. I, I hate pixelated pictures, but this is the only one they had, is working uh, with this group, Jumpstart Philly, Seku mentioned it earlier. It's an organization in Philadelphia that's working to try to combat some of the issues around redlining and get more African Americans uh, kind of as developers. And so it's a training program. We train local residents in certain zip codes to flip houses, and then we have a loan product that's really easily accessible that gets them into their first kind of construction project. And I started the West Philadelphia kind of uh, section of it. We've done 120 students in the last year. We floated five loans, um, which is about seven projects. Uh, so like to me, this is super important work that you know, as a traditional architect, I wouldn't have really been able to engage. And all that to say is like all of these things that I do, this is kind of that long list that looks like who is going down. These are all the other organizations that I've kind of been involved with, either as a board member, as a committee member, as an advisory board member, uh, across my time. And so architecture is this broad thing that you can kind of stay active with all the time. Um, and part of why I did this was because I wasn't working traditionally in the field, kind of being involved in all these different organizations allowed me to stay connected to the field. And it's interesting because now in Philadelphia, I've become a spokesperson for the field. So much so that this isn't out yet, so you guys are kind of getting a preview. This is an article that's celebrating the 150th anniversary of uh, the, the Philadelphia chapter of AIA. It's the second chapter of AIA in the country, and it's coming out in the winter. Um, but they wanted me to talk about my perspective on the 150 years of the organization, as well as kind of commemorate the 50 year of the, uh, of the Whitney M. Young speech. And so I just kind of want to close with one of the lines from the Whitney M. Young speech, because it always scares me how relevant it still is. And Renee kind of did a, she did a remix of it earlier. But uh, one thing he said was, as a profession, you are not a profession that has distinguished itself 
by your social and civic contributions to the cause of civil rights. And I'm sure this has not come to any of you as a shock. You are most distinguished by your thunderous silence and your complete irrelevance. So my challenge is, how do we change that? How do we change that in school? How do we change that in practice? And it starts with individuals. Like, your teacher can't teach it to you. You can't expect it to come from the school. It has to come from within. And so my challenge to each of you, as your students and you're sitting here, is figure out the thing that drives you. It can be anything, right? But figure out the thing that drives you. And while you're here, while you have this space, while you have the time and the support and the resources around you to learn something about it, do it. Because there's always going to be a million things to keep you from doing it. And we all know studio takes up your entire life. It doesn't change. But there's no more time when you get out of school. The time does not like magically appear the day you graduate from architecture school. It keeps getting worse as you get adulting is not fun. So <laughs> Figure it out and learn about it, because you're in the best place now. One, all these books are free. They're not free once you graduate. You have to pay for them. And my Amazon account will let you know, like, I buy so many books that I'm like, when I was in school, I had this every day for free. <laughs> and here I am paying $250 on Amazon just because I remember this one picture from like 2006 that I'm trying to find. Uh, that's what's going to get us to the next step. And kind of circling back, like, I was called a pawn, right? But checkmate, the pawn can take the queen. So always remember, have your own goal in mind because you got the rest of your career. So 